Welcome, dear listeners, to a very special episode of The Partial Historians. Me! Woo! <laughs> um, I am Dr. Greenfield. And I am The Radness. The welcome one. one, welcome all. Welcome indeed. And this is a very exciting episode for us. It one, is. because it is episode 60. I know, and so we thought to celebrate the fact that we don't look a day over 40. <laughs> so young, so fresh. <laughs> Which is lucky, because we're not. (laughs) Yeah, I'd be sorry. We're doing something a bit special today, aren't we? We are. We are. I know we left people on tender hooks at the end of our last episode. We did. And and said that that we'd say more about the Tribune of the Plebs. But I interrupt normal programming (laughs) with a special announcement. Yes, we decided that we actually didn't have that much more to say right now about the Tribune of the Plebs, and that it was apt timing to veer, of course, and do something totally different, Mm. Monty Python style. (laughs) Indeed. Yeah. And so we are going to be looking at, for a couple of episodes, a little bit of Rome on film. Indeed. My which favorite. Era. I was going to say, <laughs> uh, listeners, if you've been listening closely, uh, is Dr. Radness's special area. Indeed. And we've recently seen a resurgence of Rome on film. Yes. And but in a kind of weird way, like not like a, not like gladiator. It's like a not in like an epic Rome glory of the empire sort of let's have a yeah. narrative about it. But yeah. Rome on film being incorporated into narratives of Hollywood navel gazing, essentially. (laughs) Nice. I feel like that's, you a, know, that's a glamorous way of putting it. It's yeah. the snake eating its own tail. Yeah, Hollywood yeah. making films about Hollywood making films about Rome. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's why we thought, what better time to do it than now? Just Which? after Oscar season and just after <laughs> they've gone off screen. <laughs> just you wait. Exactly. It's very um, exciting. It's very exciting. So we're going to be looking at in this episode mm. the film Trombo. Yes. Now, it is, I suppose, a bit of a a long stretch for some of our listeners, but I think it's very interesting. Um, Because Dalton Trumbo was a screenwriter who happened to write the best film ever made, Spartacus. What? I know. I know. Um, and the movie Trumbo itself is about the uh, the period that's sort of known for like the being the the golden age of epics when a lot of uh, the better known Roman films were made. So, you know, Quo Vadis, Van Hur, The Robe, Nicosta Rounded Off, Spartacus. So, it's all happening. Yeah, so it's kind of the, it's about the era, really, in which um, Spartacus was to emerge like a butterfly and soar. <laughs> Um, yes, yes. Okay, uh, I, I, I've done my thing now. I don't, I don't really have a thing yeah. to say about that. I'm like, the image itself is enough. Yeah, okay. So, we always start with a bit of background. Okay, about who uh, Dalton Trumbo is, because this is basically a biopic. It's focusing very much on the life of Dalton Trumbo, but as most biopics do, uh, it's very hard to tell an entire life in one movie. And so they're focusing on the most notorious episode of Dalton Trumbo's life, which is uh, when he comes up against uh, the House of Un-American Activities um, and... Oh, sorry, committee. I left out a word there. HUAC, which I, I refer to as HUAC from now on. Um, and when he gets blacklisted, um, essentially for refusing to answer the question, are you or are you not a member of the <laughs> Communist Party? <laughs> well, yeah. I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> but before I give you an answer, <laughs> let me just say this. <laughs> uh, so, Dr. G, you saw this film rather recently, and Don Trumbo is not someone you've probably come across all that often. I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts, your impressions of Dalton Trumbo after seeing the movie as someone relatively new to the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Rome on film is, is not my area of expertise. And mm. to be honest, there's very little Rome on film in this, is this film. This is true. Kurt um, Douglas is about as good as it gets. Yeah, there yeah. are some cutaways to uh, uh, Spartacus. There are. And, uh, there are yeah, yeah so <laughs> some nice moments where they've CGI'd the actor playing Kirk Douglas I over know, Kurt Douglas. I know. Uh, you're like, oh, that's a clever strategy. <laughs> um, but for me, it felt like... Trombo came across as a character who was somehow flirting with communism mm. and not really engaged with it, which I felt they they tried to really emphasize in the setup because yeah. the film opens with him sort of hanging out at his glorious sort of uh, ranch. Ranch, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the lazy tea. <laughs> yeah. You know, with the fam and, you know, yeah. having nice picnics and yes. barbecues with everybody and yeah. stuff like that. Um, and living a very nice life. Yes. Um, but holding to these particular sort of academic ideals yes. to do with Marx and to do with communism. Yeah. And 
sort of talking the talk, but not necessarily not walking the walk. Necessarily walking yeah. the walk. And I think what the blacklist does to Trumbo, at least in the, in the course of the film, yeah. is reveal how willing he is to stick by the ideal when time gets tough. Interesting. I like it. I like it. Well, okay. To give you a bit of background on DT, Dalton Trumbo, <laughs> for those in the know. <laughs> Um, he what he actually had quite uh, an interesting life um, in that he he actually had known poverty um, himself. Although the film sort of opens at this very prosperous point in his career when he's uh, one of you know pretty much the highest paid Holly, um, Hollywood screenwriter. Um, he he was to strike a deal with MGM that was pretty much the most lucrative contract ever ever made, where he um, he basically would have a choice of either taking three thousand dollars a week, which you know. Back in 1940s, not too sham. Man, I don't even earn three thousand. <laughs> I know that's right. It's now, yeah, yeah. Or, or he could choose to take seventy five thousand dollars per script. Very, very lucrative. Yeah, um, and just to show how much they, I suppose they are, uh, they were keen to get him on on contract at MGM. They agreed for the first time um, not to include a morals clause in his contract, which I will come back to. Now, this is the high point, but. Up till then, he um, he'd actually his his family had fallen on hard times when he was a young man, and so he'd had to work to support his mother and his sisters, um, and he'd actually had to work in a bakery and sort of uh, slave away during the depression, and he was really really poor at this point in time, um, and he actually would write about his experiences, you know, sort of trying to make money on the side through illegal means, like, you know, bootlegging and that sort of thing, and all the sort of shiftiness and the corruption, because being in a bakery, of course, he was, you know, working in the, in the dark a lot of the time, as in at night, not literally with no lights on. That sounded weird. <laughs> it was the Depression, guys. Electricity got yeah, turned off for a right. whole decade. <laughs> what I mean is he was, uh, he was working during night times, and so, yeah. you know, he got to see, you know, sort of, I suppose, perhaps a bit more of a seedy... No, and perhaps this is where he learnt the skills that would serve him so well when he got black. Perhaps, and... yeah. And you know, he sort of saw the corruption of you know cops and that sort of thing. So all that kind of stuff, I think, um, perhaps for- shaped his character a little bit in terms of what he felt was fair and just in the world and that sort of thing. Anyway, he ended up writing about those experiences and uh, that writing led to him getting published in magazines and eventually he worked his way into being, um, uh, you know, working in sort of a low level at Hollywood studios, sort of proofing scripts, improving scripts, and then eventually working his way up to be a screenwriter. So that's a bit of background about Dalton Trumbo, the man. Um, and interestingly, um, interestingly because most of his friends um, who were also screenwriters were Jewish, he wasn't from a Jewish background. He was actually from a Christian scientist background. Interesting. Yeah, and he actually had to watch... Um, his dad had actually fallen sick when... Um, when they were sort of falling on hard times and uh, he'd actually have to watch his dad like die because he would not accept you know medical treatment and that oh, sort of wow. thing. so yeah he's kind of an interesting guy um, and I think that comes across that comes across I think pretty well in the film hmm. he's a very interesting person um, very witty um, oh yeah. yeah well and this is the other thing that I noticed particularly about the film I yeah. felt like the screenwriters for for Trumbo were very much like this is our chance to be as witty as possible <laughs> this guy had it yeah, it's oh, like he did, if we can yeah. write some lines yeah. and somebody can pull them off, it's going to be this character. Oh yeah, <laughs> like he's he's a prolific letter writer as well as pro- prolific writer. Um, and there is actually a fantastic, um, I, I suppose you call it a documentary of sorts on Trumbo that was released a few years ago. Which I, if you if you're a fan of his work or you were you know, your interest was sparked by the film, please watch it because it's basically just a whole bunch of celebrities that um, either has some connection to him, like. Michael Douglas, for example, through Kirk Douglas and um, and that sort of thing, or you know, children of um, of people he worked with, like um, I think uh, Donald Sutherland, Kiefer Sutherland. He worked with Donald Sutherland, um, reading out his letters, and they are hilarious. Like if you if you ever want if you always thought if you thought Jerry Seinfeld's come back to people who call you at home, like tele- <laughs> telemarketers was good. Wait till you read Dalton Trumbo's <laughs> letter. He, he was a really really witty, clever guy, um, but. I suppose, um, although that comes across really well in the film, do you feel, did you get the impression that this film was obviously sort of making a bit of a hero out of him? Or? I think it was trying to do something in terms of rebil- rehabilitate him. Right. I, I suspect. Yeah. I don't know. He's surrounded by a cast of characters that yeah. ultimately just support him, even when yes. they're in conflict with him. Yes. Um, and I feel like the depths to which that would have been true to life 
is possibly open to question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because basically the film opens, as I say, at this sort of high point of his career. You know, he's flying high, he's making lots of money, um, and it's just after World War II has, has ended, essentially, so it's sort of the late 1940s. Um, now, Hollywood had actually attracted attention from government before in numerous ways. Like, um, the whole... The whole code that we have in place right now in terms of like rate film ratings and that sort of thing, that's still sort of a legacy of when um, Hollywood had perhaps not been watching what it was doing closely enough and the government got a bit annoyed and thought that it was going to be, you know, oh, so immoral. So they had to sort of self-impose a code, um, which became very, very strict. And, you know, the whole, you know, the, you can't see anyone go to the bathroom and married couples can't share a bed or, you know, you oh, have to have you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, the, the famous sort of cliches about that period. Um but it had also attracted attention before for being a hotbed for communism. Ah, uh, yes. Wow. Yeah. Heaven forfend that anybody be left. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and so there had actually been sort of investigation before World War II into communism in Hollywood. Um, but the industry actually stood firm against this investigation, um, which was headed up by a guy called Martin Dees um, under the, the Dees Committee. And um, they didn't really get anywhere surprisingly enough they couldn't really find any evidence of you know treason or, you well know. in that case if hollywood's been investigated before what yeah. is it about this second round after the close of well, world war is, ii yeah this which is means it. that hollywood yeah. breaks ranks and allows this committee some sort of foothold to do an investigation this is i think the question that um that historians to this day are still kind of trying to answer i and knew we- i was a historian for <laughs> asking the right questions <laughs> that's right look at that look at go. <laughs> yeah this is exactly it, it it's, it's kind of hard to really put your finger on it mm. um and i mean i think perhaps the, obviously the outbreak of war and pearl harbor and america getting involved in world war ii that had obviously neutralized the situation a little bit in that People had other things on their mind. Um, communism, obviously, with Russia being allied with the US in World War Two, you know, people weren't as concerned about people who were, you know, allying themselves. Not maybe with communism per se, but they had bigger fish to fry, and and being a friend to Russia wasn't a bad thing during the war. It was actually quite a good thing. They would actually make movies sort of promoting a positive view of having a relationship with Russia. Um, but it was all this sort of stuff would come back to bite people, you know. After the war, Cold War breaks out, Russia's suddenly the enemy again. So it <laughs> could be partly that, mm. this outbreak of sort of uh, the Cold War and this... Leads to a change in attitudes. Yeah, yeah, maybe that. That probably has something to do with it. Um, but, there, and you know, obviously I think, uh, you know, there's obviously a general sort of um, conservative feeling in America at that point in time. You know, not, yeah. ju- not just in terms of... Well, sort of the 1950s in particular are Notorious, characterized yeah. by <laughs> massive social conservatism. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, perhaps there is no place for communism yeah. in this idolized world of the nuclear family. That's exactly it, yeah. So everything's getting more conservative in terms of, like, you know, gender politics and that sort of thing, not just, like, communism and that sort of thing. So everything is getting a bit more conservative. Um, and basically, um, there has been some, some conflict within the Hollywood um, system itself. Um, between these sort of, you know, leftists and the more conservatives, not necessarily over, you know, are you a communist or are you not, but more in terms of how this system's going to be run. As in, are you going to have unions that have power? Are you going to have writers that have creative control? Because we're, of course, talking about a period where it's the studio system. The studios rule. They can sign on stars um, for, you know, you know, for very long contracts, and they have total control over what that star will and will not make in terms of movies. They can loan them out if they choose to, to other studios if they really want to do a role, but they can also not. They can make them do a role that they're really not comfortable with doing. Sounds a little bit like slavery. Yeah, (laughs) a little little bit. And the thing is, around this time, around 1947, when you start to get um, this second round of investigations into, um, into communism in Hollywood, this is around the time that the studio system is starting to crack. Hmm. Okay, there, there people is people are breaking away, making their own studios. It's not, it's not quite that early. Um, hmm. in the 1950s, you will start to see um some very powerful, well, maybe not always the most powerful stars, but you just do start to see some stars starting to resent the studio system and breaking away. Hmm. Um, more than you have before. Kirk Douglas being one of those, Marilyn Monroe being one of the first. Okay, people who are starting to form their own production companies as a way of sort of getting around studio control, but that doesn't happen sort of till the early 1950s. 
what's happening to the studios at this point in time is that um, previously the studios had a total monopoly in that not just on the stars, like they didn't just own their own back lots where they could, you know, film everything there. They owned all the talent. It wasn't just that. They also owned the cinemas where the movies were shown. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it's not, a monopoly. Exactly. It was all a total right. monopoly. And basically, in 1948, there was a, um, the ruling came through that this was unlawful. Okay, in a very famous case. And so the studios were ordered to start selling off their chains, their cinema chains. Okay. So well, their this power starts to weaken their power. It does. It starts to weaken their power. So I think they're perhaps uh, overly sensitive to, you know, unions that are also fighting for more control when at the time when they're losing control and they kind of know it. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. And, and also, obviously, as you can see, like with the 1950s being the era where the stars will start to break away from the studio system, I think that there was probably maybe, maybe a hint of that in the wind. And so they are getting a little bit nervous themselves. The other thing, though, I think, is that um, most of the studio heads um, are, you know, the kind of guys that most Americans, I think, would probably look up to and that they're self-made men. You know, guys who came out with nothing, immigrant families, changed their name, built, you know, built these studios from the ground up. You know, that's the sort of legend of a lot of these guys. And a lot of them were Jewish originally. Mm. Now... Out of the um, the men who were subpoenaed in the first round of um, of um, Hollywood hearings in 1947, the vast majority were Jewish. Okay, so now it's sounding like a bit of like a, a an ethnic cleansing of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. um, that sounds terrible. Yeah, no. Um, it, 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 does America realize what they're doing here? It, I mean, it, it they did fight weird. against the Germans, didn't it, they? It seems weird, but like these are the kind of allegations that are th- being thrown around at these people at this time that you are prematurely anti-fascist, that you're making um, films that are pro-Semitic. Like it's kind of it, it's it's a weird thing. I know it's really weird to kind of figure out exactly what's going on at this point in time. I but, hesitate to ask, um, and I'm hoping there's no real good answer. But what would make something pro-Semitic anyway? Don't answer that question. Yeah. That's not a real. I can't answer. I can't answer. It was, it was more. I suppose um, there were films that were being made at that point in time. I mean, the one I can sort of remember off the top of my head is a movie called Crossfire, mm. um, which is a uh, sort of a. I suppose it's a movie about. Um, Sort of, I suppose, uh, heroizing a, 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 a Jewish guy who'd been targeted and, and yeah. uh, you know, kind of. So, providing a counter narrative is yeah. now considered to be I, I, too I far. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how to exactly explain it, but yeah, it's kind of like um, telling telling their stories yeah. and being like, "Well, this is unfair." I suppose yeah. <laughs> so that that kind of attitude. Um, yeah, it seems really weird, but it has been suggested by some historians that perhaps. Um, the studio heads were getting a little bit nervous about the types of people that were being targeted, being of Jewish background themselves. Yeah. Um, and, Fair enough. And so they were worried about, okay, well, if we don't go along with this and sort of play along here, what is going to happen? You know, um, and, and also they didn't, want, they didn't want government involvement, as in telling them what they could and couldn't make. So kind of like with the code where they said, okay, 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 we're being too immoral. We'll come up with something. We'll, we'll, Trust uh, me. We'll it'll be, self-regulate. Exactly. It'll be ironclad. <laughs> That's exactly it. They wanted self-regulation. The money where they were getting, um, you know, where they were, you know, their financiers, they were mostly pretty conservative guys. So mm. all this kind of stuff converging together seems to have been like, you know, a new set of circumstances sort of arise, I suppose. Because yeah. at first... The studio heads are not keen on this idea of um, of blacklisting guys that are going to be up in front of this committee well, who's investigating yeah. communism. They, they're like, no, we, we're not interested in doing this. You know, this is not something we're up for, which is exactly what they said before. Yeah, and to me, yeah. one of the things that's really curious yeah. and uh, is the extent to which the fear of communism permeates America. Yes. I mean, it, to me, yeah. it's still incredibly... Oh, I think it's still a, there. Yeah. A, a baffling part of their history, but still yeah. there. Yeah. Um, well, and a fear and, of socialism, like, yeah. or, or government having too much power. Well, yeah. governments that support citizens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Seems to be a bit of a thing for, for America, historically. Yeah. So, I, I think it's really curious because, like, you see the intensity yes. of this anti-leftist yeah. rhetoric yeah. starting to become action. Yes. And searching for communists and trying to figure out what would define a communist as opposed to yeah. not a communist. Yeah. Um, obviously, your affiliation with the Communist Party is a clear marker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But this is the thing. Nobody knew that really for sure at this point in time yeah. because some of the people who, who would eventually be called up, it's literally been, you know, like, they went to a meeting. Yeah. You know, they, they ha- or they, they dated someone who 
was a communist or mm. they were married to someone who was a communist or they you know once upon a time had a subscription to the daily worker you know the <laughs> communist um newspaper um it, it could become very tenuous yeah you know and it could be nothing at all like mm. obviously those cases where it's nothing at all are probably rarer you know you know than you than you might think but there certainly are instances of people who literally would say something like i don't agree with this these hearings yeah, yeah. and those people would find themselves blacklisted there so are examples of that what we see in the film yeah. is he trombo is not called forward for the first round he is actually he yes is? yeah this is basically this is the thing basically what what sort of happens is this um there is this group of very conservative people within mm. Hollywood who form their own little organization, the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. Like, what a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and they actually invite HUAC to come to Hollywood. Oh, thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah, exactly. And this is the thing. Like, this is what I mean. Like, it's kind of a weird thing. You can see a real divide in the industry mm. itself. And at now first, I, I think people like Dalton Trumbo felt quite confident because they felt like, like before, they were going to be backed Mm. You know, like by their unions, so like the Screenwriters Guild, for example, the Screen Actors Guild, Screen Directors Guild, all those, all those organisations. They kind of felt like they were probably going to be backed by them. Yeah. They felt like they were going to be backed by their studios. I mean, Dalton Trumbo literally signed that really, that really lucrative contract that same year. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, it seems so unlikely that anything, was really, that anything really bad was actually going to happen. Yeah. Um, and when the... T- when, um, when the first subpoenas went out, there were about 43. Eventually, um, uh, eventually 19 were actually sort of called up. And uh, But of the people who would actually end up sort of facing the committee and be indicted, you, you get this Hollywood 10. You get 10 guys left standing, mm. essentially. Um, and uh, of those Hollywood 10, they sort of agreed. Uh, most of them were screenwriters. There, was, uh, there were no actors. And um, there was, I think, one guy who had producing uh, background and one guy with a directing background. So most of them were screenwriters. So you'll notice that they are perhaps the guys that, for the, as far as the studio is concerned, were relatively expendable. Mm. In terms of people who have... They're not on the screen. Yeah, they have, they have influence over what goes into movies, which is obviously what the committee was concerned of, you know, like people being brainwashed by secret communist messages <laughs> in films. That's kind of what they were interested in. If you play in. the film backwards. Yeah. <laughs> it says Marx was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, workers of the world do that. Yeah, um, that's exactly what they were kind of looking into. Um, but these guys basically decided that, okay, well, this is a, this is a con- congressional committee. It's not a criminal trial. Okay, they can't actually do that Anything. much to you. Yeah. Uh, all they can, all they can really do is, okay, make your life hell, <laughs> and um, they can um, cite you for contempt of Congress, but that's about it. Yeah. Um. So they they felt relatively confident. Hmm. Um. And certainly in the beginning, they had good reason to, because you know people within Hollywood as well who, um, you know, not necessarily again, not necessarily communists, but people who. Um, didn't like what it was the committee was all about, which was prying into your political beliefs and your right to free speech and that sort of thing. Um, they formed a committee um, for the First Amendment because that's what the Hollywood Ten decided they were going to plead, the First Amendment, not the Fifth. Okay, which the first is, of course, your right to free speech, free association. Yeah, so, and this is this plays out in a couple of scenes in it the does. film. It does, yeah, it does. Um, where there's a confrontation with John Wayne. Yes. How historical is my question? <laughs> well, John Wayne certainly was... Um, part of that conservative organization okay okay um uh and the people who were part of the other side so the committee for the first amendment who, who flew to washington to support the 10 mm. in their round of hearings which were memorably i think recreated by brian cranston in the film um were people very well-known people that you might you might you might remember lauren mccall Oh yes, Humphrey Bogart. Oh yes, yeah. See exactly like these sorts of people who were <laughs> those sorts of people. those sorts of people, and they made they made radio programs together. Okay, so while some of the committee were flying to Washington to support the Hollywood Ten, other people like Judy Garland were on the radio mm-hmm. supporting them and saying this is not right. You should not have you know this kind of power over us. Like you have no right to ask these questions. Mm. Um, and it does. I think there is a consensus um, these days, and even sort of at the time, I think people were aware of this, and this is why the studio heads themselves were a bit sort of, well, we don't really want to blacklist people because, you know, or fire people. <laughs> what about the work? Because of the way the studio system worked, um, it, it was a little bit of a, and, you know, it still is like this. It, content goes through many hands before it finally reaches the screen. You know, yeah. there's often one screenwriter, there's obviously producers involved, there's directors involved, there's actors involved, there's editors involved. And then the studio head has to sign off on the product, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
it's very unlikely that anyone could get something into a film that a studio head didn't approve of, <laughs> particularly communist propaganda. Yeah. And we certainly see that script writing process going through multiple layers in yes, this film as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah. Um, particularly yeah. once uh, Trumbo ends up on this blacklist, yes. where he starts sort of selling himself on the black market <laughs> yeah. of script writing. Yeah. Um, and part of his gig is to do rewrites. Yes. Um, and multiple rewrites, and exactly. whatever rewrites are necessary. Exactly. Um, yeah. Until. The director or the head of that studio approves those changes. Exactly, yeah. So if uh, the scriptwriter is a communist and you can tell from the script, then you would have to also assume that the head of the studio is also a communist exactly. because they've agreed that that's yeah. the script they want made. Exactly. And so it kind of seems like uh, that maybe the studio head sort of thought, well, we play along, that way we keep our independence. Um, perhaps we won't come under fire in, in, you know, in any way. And also, it was kind of meant to stop with the 10. I, I was going to say, I think yeah. it was probably like the assumption would be, look, we've given, here are our sacrificial lambs. Precisely. Yeah. Now leave us alone. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it became a very interesting case. And one of the reasons why I find it interesting is because of Donald Trumbo himself. Hmm. Okay, um, they, so they decided to plead the First Amendment and say, because we have a right to free speech or whatever, you know, you have no right to... Be, t- be doing this to us. Yeah. Saying um, you're a communist or saying something about communism is yeah. not breaking the law. Exactly. And you mm. see quite memorably um, Brian Cranston reenacting Dalton Trumbo's very famous <laughs> attack on the committee because, of course, Dalton Trumbo was very good with words. And uh, the people who ran the committee at this point in time, a guy called J. Parnell Thomas, were not. <laughs> um, and so T- Trumbo basically said, Show me the evidence. Yep. Show me the evidence that you have against me that in any way proves that I've done something wrong. Because most, co- com- you know, most of the communists, and I'm using my little flashcards here, most of the communists in Hollywood, like Dalton Trumbo, as you pointed out, they were, they were what's, like, you know, what the true believers called cocktail communists, in that they did live the life of a rich guy, but they did speak up for social pro- you know, progress and change. Yeah. And... I actually don't have a problem with this. I actually think that was showcased quite well in the movie in terms of um, using the, the fictional friend who's also apparently part of the Hollywood 10, which is meant to be a sort of amalgamation of many of the, the other members of the Hollywood 10. Um, who, uh, the other screenwriter, Heard, I've heard, mm-hmm. um, played by Louis C.K. Mm-hmm. Louis C.K. I think he voices that disconnect yeah, yeah. reasonably well and I was actually I wasn't sure they were going to do that so I'm glad that they actually kind of did raise that point of view but yeah. really what people in Hollywood who were like Donald Trumbo were fighting for was generally just a more progressive attitude mm. particularly to like race relations and that sort of thing like even just like you know taking out what we would consider to be hideously offensive racial slurs like Japs or something like that like just not using that word and using another word instead that's generally what they were trying to do mm. okay that's the kind of progress they wanted to see they weren't trying to overthrow the american government so then i guess my question is is like what is the position of these intense conservatives this group this alliance yeah the, the well, let's just call no, it the mpa <laughs> all right all right this group this conservative group in hollywood yeah um what is their rationale and where are they coming from what do we really know about them Oh, look, I mean, there's obviously a, f- a, f- a few members, and they're not the only ones. There are also um, committees um, like the American Legion. Um, they, they, they're quite a, um, a, a widespread um, group of about 3 million American members, and, and they will end up um, threatening to boycott Spartacus because Dalton Trumbo wrote it. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, so their threats are... They have some weight because they have a reasonable amount of members. And I, th- I think it, it is it is obviously something that it's not like... Obviously, you can't sort of say there was the left and there was the right, but there certainly are a lot of people who are very conservative in their politics hmm. um, at this point in time, and that includes within Hollywood, and are virulently anti-communist. Okay, and Hedda Hopper, who is... Um, oh, Helen Mirren. Yeah, who's Helen Mirren in this. <laughs> um, she was actually one of those people. Um, mm. it, although, obviously, there's, I'm sure there's more to her life than what you see. That I don't I, think well, I would hope so, because yeah. she comes off pretty poorly in the film yeah. um, as being ultra-conservative. She was ultra-conservative. And nasty as an individual. I don't think she was particularly nice. Like, honestly, mm. I, I, obvi- I would say it, it is obviously a fairly one-dimensional role in that you don't see anything else of her. Yeah. But Hedda Hopper was actually, um, she was actually an Mm -hmm. ex-actress who'd been in the movies herself in the early days and had eventually become um, one of the most feared gossip columnists in Hollywood. (laughs) um, Rivaled only really by people like Luella Parsons and Walter Winchell. Um, But she was 
incredibly conservative, absolutely, you know, hated anything like hint of communism, like hated it and quite happy to destroy people's careers. Wow. Um, you know, in order to take down, you know, what she perceived as a threat to America. Wow. Okay, yeah. so she's a gossip columnist with an she is agenda. A gossip- yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> she's got a clear slant. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I don't obviously, I don't, I don't know that that uh, encounter with, um, I think it was meant to be Louis B. Mayer in the movie where she, you know, called him a kike or anything. I don't know that that ever actually happened, but she certainly um, threatened a lot of people. Mm. Um, in that, you know, if you don't fire this person, I will expose you and, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what the studios were, I think, were essentially uh, scared of, like, losing money. You know, if, if, if people like Hedda Hopper, um, you know, did publicise that there were heaps of communists working in the industry and, and did set, tell people that there was propaganda in the movies, okay, yeah, it's not like everyone's going to believe them, but they could lose sales and they couldn't afford to lose sales at that point in time, particularly with the, you know, TV getting bigger and being a real threat in the 1950s. Yeah. This is not the time. <laughs> not yeah. the time. For them, yeah, it, was yeah. not the, it was not the time to be brave. Yeah, yeah. Um, they want to play it safe. Yeah. So they're going to send some people um, to the committee. They're yeah. going to get some people blacklisted, so be it. Yeah, and it is a very complex procedure, which we probably don't have time to go into. But the thing that um, I actually do admire about Dalton Trumbo is that uh, I'm going to come back to his contract. He did not have a morals clause in his contract. So when a lot of the other people were suspended or fired by their studios, who did eventually cave rather unexpectedly and um, write this thing called the Waldorf Agreement, where they agreed not to hire any member of the Hollywood Ten, mm. nor anyone who you know refused to cooperate eventually. Um, when that Waldorf Agreement you know, sort of came out and that sort of thing, technically they didn't have a leg to stand on with Dalton Trumbo because they couldn't fire him for violating the morals clause of his contract. Ah, because it okay. wasn't there. Because it wasn't there. So why is there no moral clause? Well, because he was because he was um, so sought after at that point in time. It was obviously something he was able to negotiate. And I th- yeah. they did they did say that in the film, like they did make a note of that, which again I thought was quite good because that is important. Because what Dalton Trumbo could have done is he could have separated himself from the other members of the ten and fought his case against the studios for compensation and whatever separately. Yeah. Okay. And he um, chose not to. And he chose not to. He knew that the problem was if he did that, number one, the other guys would have to take a different tactic. Mm. Number two, if he won, then the others would all lose because yeah. they could point to his case and say, yeah, but he does. He didn't have a morals clause. You do. You lose. Yeah. And so he threw his eggs in with everybody else and decided mm. to take a different tactic. And, as, and, and it wasn't a successful one. I mean, they did eventually get... Um, you know, in civil court, a small settlement from the studios mm. because of the um, violations of all their contracts. Um, well, not all of them, but some of them. Um, but it was not even enough to cover their legal costs. Wow. So it was, you know... Everyone, a pyrrhic victory at best. Exactly, yeah. I think everyone was like, who cares? Um, the thing that I think that was interesting about the movie is that obviously they had to condense a lot of things. So they condensed a lot of members of the Hollywood Ten into one fictional friend <laughs> or, or kind of friend, I suppose, yeah, associate yeah. of Dalton Trumbo so that he could talk to. Yeah. Um, that's obviously one thing. How did you feel about that in terms of, do you have a feeling about people condensing characters and in films into... Oh, I, well, I feel like it always, it, it strips complexity, obviously, but yeah. it also shortens the length of the film. Yeah. And it was quite a long movie. <laughs> it yeah. was, it was relatively long. Yeah. Um, I feel like they, what they attempted to do was yeah. to give the character Trumbo the platform to be able to, to do the things that sort of follow the timeline. Yes. Um, and to enable that, it was important to like strip like the complexity of of the web of relationships that yes. is going on yeah and that's just it there's so you know we, when you do have 10 other guys well sorry nine other guys on this initial blacklist yeah fighting their legal case it becomes very yeah. complex yeah and you yeah. see you see hints of other characters <laughs> who are clearly on the fringe of that yes um but there's no real focus no on no it. um yeah yeah they, they do focus quite well i mean they sorry, they do highlight quite well the fact that uh, again when they when they lost, yeah, they all basically go out in there and say, no, I'm not going to answer that question, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they do a reasonable job, I think, of pointing out that um, the way that the 10 conducted themselves at those initial hearings, like being very passionate um, and outspoken, partic- particularly, um, not that he's a, I don't think he's even really mentioned in the in the movie, people like John Howard Lawson, who was the once head of the Screenwriters Guild um, and perhaps one of the more leftist members of that group. Um, they don't sort of... They didn't really show, I think, how disgusted people were by their behaviour. They actually weren't... 
a lot, they lost a lot of support because they did get angry and shout and you know people were expecting them to be much calmer I, I, I mean I don't know how I, I have to be I don't, I don't really I think that's kind of a bit of a cop out in a sense yeah because um, I think the members of the committee were pretty quickly told look you've got to disassociate yourself or you're dead too because um, it did take some time for people like Humphrey Bogart to win their way back yeah, um, yeah. with the audiences um, and they had to you know they had to do things like write articles saying I am not a communist like <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm no commie I think was the head of an article that oh, Humphrey God. Bogart had to write so they, they did have to fight, claw their way back yeah, into favour themselves yeah. and so they sort of distanced themselves rather quickly after those initial hearings mm. and then the movie does highlight quite well the fact that they were expecting to win on appeal but then two people who were on the, <laughs> on the court who unfortunate were, circumstances yeah, yeah who were more of more of a left persuasion yeah more of their political bent died unexpectedly and therefore that's sort of put things back or did they die unexpectedly (laughs) i think is the real question the interesting thing is though that because the hollywood 10 did fight their cases um for so long appealing these contempt of congress citations and that sort of thing they did actually stave off any further hearings Mm. No one was willing to blocking up the system. They did. As it were. They did, and so that's why you really only hear about these guys in the 1940s. It's not until the 1950s that you you get into the next round mm. um, of hearings, and that's when that's when the more I think I think that's actually what people are more familiar with. That's when you get you know people like Joe McCarthy deciding that well if you could take on Hollywood you could take on the army and all that sort of thing as well. <laughs> Um, and that's when you get people pleading the fifth, not mm. the first. Yeah. Okay, and that's where obviously you're right not to incriminate yourself. The problem is, though, you're kind of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't by that point in time because if you plead the fifth, the studios won't hire you. Yeah. If you admit that you're a communist and name names, you're probably equally untouchable. <laughs> so it's kind, of, it's kind of one of those weird things. But yeah. people obviously still feel quite passionate about it because... Um, well, fair enough, because it's the sort of accusation that yeah. is based completely on rumour. It it's is, like accusing yeah. anybody of something that they haven't done. Yeah. There's no way to establish an alibi for yourself when you haven't no, done it. No, and that's thing. exactly what the studio said initially when, when all this stuff sort of came out. They said, well, you know, what if someone just has the same name as someone in Hollywood? Like, how do you know that it's that same person mm. if it's just a name on a list at a meeting? You can't prove it. What about spelling mistakes? Yeah. But the committee didn't really care about that. They were just like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're coming for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and so it was. it's kind of... Um, yeah, it, it's kind of a, a difficult situation for everyone to be in. But the, the funny thing is, the studios still managed to salvage people who they perceived to be of value to them. Not a lot of people, but... Um, and this is something that's perhaps not as talked about. But, for example, Judy Holiday was set to become a big studio star. She was, like, on the brink of being a really big hit for, um, for her studio when this whole thing happened Mm. um and she had sort of flirted with communism in the past like not in a major way but um she would have been called up if it weren't for intervention like a deal being done basically between the committee and the studio not to summon her and to leave her alone Mm. and i think that just shows you know what so there's a level of corruption involved here somewhat i mean uh, like there were still people notable people who were you know whose careers were ruined and That is something that I kind of feel like a movie like this is kind of important because Dalton Trumbo was a very was very clever in the way he handled the situation that happened. Well, that's going to be my next big question. I think is like to what degree is Trumbo really the central figure here? Yeah, he's clearly the central figure in the film. Sure, Um, is that reflected in your understanding of the history of the Ten and what unfolds with the black market script writing and things like that? I think he he certainly is one of the central figures. I Mm. mean, the the problem is that um, there were certainly other screenwriters who were equally, if not more, talented as Dalton Trumbo on that list, who were his friends, um, like Michael Wilson. and he, and he worked with them, you know, they worked together. And, and Ring Lardner Jr., um, who wrote MASH, um, you know, people like that who uh, perhaps even... Dalton Trumbo is perhaps someone people these days aren't as familiar with because his screenwriting can be kind of a bit dated by our tastes. Um, but, you know, he did write things like Roman Holiday and that sort of thing. Um, but he certainly was um, very, very fast. Mm-hmm. That, that was his big asset. He was a very... He, he wrote very quickly... Um, and he was det- he was very determined to get um, this, to, to rectify the situation somehow to salvage this situation somehow 
um, to support his family, you know, um, which I think is captured in the film. Yeah. And uh, what they didn't do, and I think there's probably a lack of time here, is that they didn't show that to save money, the Trumbos actually, when they sold their ranch, which was for a fraction of what it was worth, of course, because everyone knew they had him over a barrel, um, they moved to Mexico for a while to try and keep living costs down with some of the other fam- members oh, of the Hollywood okay. team yeah, and their yeah. families. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where he probably got the idea for the brave one, you mm. know, the bullfight movie. Um, and th- But he did eventually move back. Um, and he, he certainly was, he certainly did have, I think, the idea for the network where basically people would contact him and say, could you doctor this script? It's not very good. <laughs> if he couldn't do it, he would then make himself like the central point where he would pass it on to, to another else. blacklisted writer. Yeah. Yeah, so he kind of did manage a lot of things. And it was a very difficult time because, of course, if someone chose not to pay you when you're on the blacklist, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. You can't admit that they hired you in the first place. <laughs> Otherwise, you're all... Who are you going to talk to? You're operating outside of the union. Exactly. And that's exactly what... In fact, what... you've gone against all of your communist principles at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, And so basically, you've got people who are... You know, some people might choose not to pay you. They might mm. choose not to pay you as much as they said they were going to. Um, you're having to juggle lots of different pseudonyms, you know, because that's one way of getting around the blacklist. Oh, yes. Well, yeah. this is my other question. Yeah. Because you have this moment where this script wins on a name Which that... Which is totally true. Yeah? It totally yeah. happened. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, and that's what I mean. It became, <laughs> it became ridiculous. Like, at first, it was all very cloak and dagger and, yeah. you know... Um, in the early 1950s, because the next round was only just saying to kick off, you could ask a friend of yours who wasn't yet blacklisted to sell the script on your behalf and then split the proceeds, like like you see Trumbo doing, mm-hmm. exactly what he did do with Robin Holiday. Yeah. Um, but eventually... Eventually they ran out of names. They started <laughs> exactly. just making up names. Yeah. Names on scripts. Scripts that win Oscars. Yeah. People you can't find. Exactly. And that's exactly it. He did start working with the King Brothers on Poverty Row, um, that what was known as Poverty Row Studios, because basically you had about five major... Sorry, you had about five studios, like major studios, and then you had these tiny little production companies that were... Turning up called, the B and C. They were known films. as Poverty Row, because they were, they were the bottom of the barrel, as you could see in that movie, <laughs> which I did enjoy. John Goodman was classic in that. Yes, yes. Um, Pumping out those sorts of movies, but that's where you could kind of get work. Mm. But eventually, as time dragged on, what Trumbo became afraid of, and what I think some of his friends were afraid of, is that it was becoming institutionalized. People were getting used to the cloak and dagger. Yeah, yeah. You know, and no one was. They were expecting ha- to not to yeah. have to pay much for and the script. And the advantage of people like, like, like the Hollywood 10 was that most of them, because they were writers, could make a living. But it wasn't what they felt they were owed. Mm. Whereas um, Trumbo did see, you know, careers of friends destroyed because they were producers, for example, and they had to, you know, the, yeah. the, the face went with the name. Yeah, yeah. You can't you know. just not produce the film yeah, and be somebody yeah. and else. He would, and, and certainly actors and all those sorts of people as well, they, they were totally screwed. Like, there's nothing you can do. Your, your face goes with your name, so what are you going to do? Um, but, yeah, Trumbo did start to think, okay, well... I'm going to have to do something about this. And what I need to do is to produce the most excellent work that I possibly can. Because Mm -hmm. if if I do that, then I have the power back again. And so with a few of his fellow blacklist friends, like Michael Wilson, that was sort of their plan. That they would somehow get a hold of a project that was so excellent. (laughs) So awesome. So awesome that they they demand screen credit. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, And the whole Robert Rich thing helped that massively. Mm. Because Michael... Wilson and um, and Dalton Trumbo, they both um, you know were Oscar nominated, and then Dalton Trumbo won an Oscar under one of their pseudonyms, and he then played with that situation with the press, <laughs> never admitting that he was Robert Rich, but yeah. giving that very strong hint that he was, and so. You kind of you kind of see in the credits. I think you saw those sorts of interviews that Trumbo used to do in yeah, his home, yeah. and he he definitely played it up. But there were those serious moments where he he was like, "Well, I'm joking around about my identity here, but." This is actually something I see, I see take quite personally because people did commit suicide because their careers were over, their families torn apart by lack of money. Like this was actually a serious time in American history. You know, not not everybody necessarily. I'm saying you know it's all rack and ruin and everything, but there were definitely people yeah. that he knew that were friends that who, were ruined that were ruined completely yeah. by this situation. Yeah. Um, and America also lost a lot of talent because a lot of people who were you know who were of European background um, or um, you know or could some people just left America yeah. rather than have to deal with this kind of stuff so one of the people who were called up in the initial hearings Bertolt Brecht he was a, um, a European director and he basically just took off after mm. his after his appearance for Congress and never came back 
Um, and you can't really, How convenient. You, you can't blame them. You no, can't blame them. not at all. Um, anyway, but to skip ahead a little bit, because I am conscious that I have been talking for some time now, <laughs> when we get to the, the whole Spartacus thing. Oh, yeah. Spartacus. Yes, exactly. It was the case that um, Dalton Trumbo ended up being needed to do a very quick rewrite for Spartacus. Okay. Um, how, how would that situation evolve? Basically, Kirk Douglas, as I said, was one of the first Hollywood actors to set up his own production company um, so that he was operating sort of outside of the studio system. Not entirely, because it was very small. So he needed the studio still to help him um, have resources and distribute the movies. But he was more the boss. He had some creative yeah. control. Oh, yeah, massively so. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he was, he'd actually just missed out on, um, he, well, he had really wanted to play Ben-Hur. I think I mentioned that before. Sad face. Sad face. <laughs> uh, hadn't got the role, feeling a bit depressed. Someone had suggested this book, um, Spartacus by Howard Fast, who of course was himself also a cited for contempt of Congress, mm. not from Hollywood, but a writer. <laughs> um, but yeah, had been, you know, gone to jail and all that kind of stuff. And he was one of the more hardline communists, one of the people that that he actually hated Dalton Trumbo because Dalton Trumbo was like a cocktail communist. <laughs> not communist enough. Not communist Howard enough, Fast. yeah. Um, and so that's why they, they never got along, even though you'd think they would share some principles. But essentially, Howard Fast had sold Spartacus to Kirk Douglas on the proviso that he was able to write the screenplay. He was a novelist, not a screenwriter. And, appara- and his, his first draft... Didn't translate very well. No. I mean, I've read his, his first, his draft, and it is essentially the novel slightly altered for screen... <laughs> It's very talky. Yeah. And so Kirk Douglas desperately needed to be able to show Universal who he was going to be working on Spartacus with, the studio. He needed to show them a script, and he needed it really quickly. And so he asked Dalton Trumbo because he knew that Dalton Trumbo was the fastest screenwriter around. And Dalton Trumbo started to see that this could really be the film that put his name back on the screen because it could really be an awesome film. Mm. Um, and so they didn't really go into this in a lot of detail in the movie because it's not their focus, but it actually ended up being a really torturous and lengthy process. Um, and certainly a lot of negotiations between Universal, Douglas, Trumbo about this whole idea of screen credit. Um, and I think the film kind of did um, hint at this. I don't know if you agree, but um, it kind of was Otto Preminger who actually forced Kirk Douglas's hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. They bring you in quite late into the piece. Yes, and I don't yeah. know anything about him as an individual. So no. who uh, is this Otto Preminger? Otto Preminger was, um, was definitely, again, I think he was actually captured pretty well in the movie, mm. um, quite an, uh, an independent director, mm. um, probably because, again, obviously European background, not quite as uh, locked in by this whole studio system as maybe people who... You know, grew up and raised in the studio system. Yeah, where, yeah. So, and he he certainly made made some very interesting films. Films that still stand the test of time. I still love some of his movies, like Anatomy of a Murder and that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Quite, yep, quite. Yep. He was quite daring for mm. his time, and he was um, looking to make uh, a movie uh, called Exodus. Right, yes. Which, given the whole religious flavour of what's been happening, you know, it's kind of... <laughs> I feel like it's flirting with danger, but yeah, do it, yeah, do it, man, yeah. do it. <laughs> anyway, um, so he was basically flirting with... Um, with well, so he was he was going to make that movie. He was yeah. obviously thinking about ha- hiring Dalton Trumbo. And it, it became a bit of a thing. I, I don't know that Dalton Trumbo was quite as clever as the film made him out to be in terms of securing screen credit for himself by playing them off against each other. <laughs> but it seems to me quite clear from what I can gather from, you know, when I look at the telegrams and the letters and that sort of thing, that I think Kirk Douglas wanted to, to have make Trumbo a splash. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He wanted to be the one to sort of make the splash. He had been thinking of... I mean, the way Kirk Douglas tells it is that he, his producer, Edward Lewis, and Stanley Kubrick, who ended up being the director of Spartacus, were sitting around talking about, okay, so whose name are we going to put on this thing? And Stanley Kubrick said, well, let's put mine on. And Kirk Douglas was revolted <laughs> by his <laughs> lack of humility or something. Um, and uh, so he says, mm, no, I don't think we're going to do that. They used Edward Lewis's name for most of the production of the film. Okay. Um, or the name Sam Jackson, mm. which, we get, which was alluded to in the movie. Um, but it was kind of an open secret. Everyone kind of knew by this stage that Trumbo was the writer, mm. um, largely thanks to the expose of gossip columnists who were trying to break, bring the film down. <laughs> um, Walter Winchell played a role in that. He wasn't really mentioned in the film. But mm. it was kind of an open secret. Everyone was kind of talking about it. Everyone kind of knew. And I think Kirk Douglas just decided, screw it, I'm taking the plunge. Everyone yeah. kind of knew that this whole... Everyone knows it anyway. It was, going to, it was drawing to an end. Things were happening. The studio system itself was definitely at 
you know, was breaking yeah. by the by nineteen sixty, um, and then, you know, pretty much be over by the end of the decade. Um, and so, yeah, I think it just all those sort of things came together, and, and that's how his name ends up appearing, you know, on the screen. And it, it did break the blacklist in America, yeah, not in Europe. Okay. Um, and it doesn't mean that that's the end of it. it. Everyone's out in the open now. There were still instances of people being fired because of public pressure yep. to fire someone who was blacklisted, but it definitely was the beginning of it's, the end. Yeah, yeah. It's the start of a stone rolling down a hill. Absolutely, Gathering yeah. some mass. Yeah, and it is interesting, I think, or as not. you say, that Hollywood wanted to, wants to tell this story about itself. Yeah, I think it's yeah. really fascinating. I yeah. feel like... I mean, I know I referenced it as navel gazing. And, you know, <laughs> no, I know what you mean. And it, it kind yeah. of is. I mean, yeah. it's a film by Hollywood about Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but it's clearly a story which, from a screenwriter's perspective, and perhaps from a creative freedom of expression perspective. Yes. And given that we're in a election cycle where somebody like Bernie Sanders is running. Yeah. Like, what a time to make this film. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it, I feel like it also has something to do with the fact that Kirk Douglas published um, yet another memoir about this period mm. of his life uh, a couple of years ago, and I think maybe that might have sort of because he actually t- you know, it, it focused it's called it's all about Spartacus, and you know he had George Clooney write the forward about how and George Clooney of course um, was very influential in making the film about the bringing down of McCarthy and Good Night and Good Luck um, with Ed, you know about Edward R. Murrow and his his duel with McCarthy on TV. Um, so yeah, it does seem to be something that I think Hollywood wants to talk about. Yeah, and it's, it's, well, it's, it's think... still it's still very controversial in Hollywood because um, about oh god, oh my god, I'm so old. I just realised what time it was. About <laughs> almost twenty years ago now, when Elia Kazan, the director, um, won his honorary Oscar, there were massive demonstrations in the late '90s against this guy because he had been one of the people who testified in the 1950s and named names. Oh, to save his goodness. career, but he made he made legendary films like On yeah. the Waterfront, hmm. and if he hadn't, those movies might not have been made, or if they were made, might not have been made to the same standard. So, hmm. but yeah, when he went to accept the Oscar, so, you know, some people were very you know vocal in supporting him, and and, and I guess I, I'm coming back to I'm coming to that point because um, some people were there was there were huge demonstrations outside the Kodak Theater, so I think it was the Kodak Theater. Um, against the against the Oscar being against given. Oscar being given to someone oh, who named names, oh, someone okay. who was a traitor. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, and I, I know every, I know this is seen as a little cop You have that that end of the movie being Dalton Trumbo's famous speech when he accepts his saying, "This is a period where there were only victims." Yeah. What did you? What was your take on that message being the the finishing point? Oh well, I feel like I mean it's I mean it's poetic, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it's a lovely way to end the film. Yeah. And it also doesn't allow for the sort of, presumably, the sorts of people who were aiming for advantage yeah. during a time of unrest. Yeah. And it's like, yes, lots of people are victims. Yeah. But some people are probably using that space in order to put themselves forward. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can only imagine how much money was saved in making movies because you could hire someone who's on the black market and someone who's yeah. desperate to feed their family. Because, I mean, let's face it. As much I as mean, we... the studios are looking to save on costs, yeah. and how convenient that they found a way to do that with their scriptwriting. Well, yeah, and we might we might chuckle down our sleeve about um, Trumbo being, you know, espousing these ideals and yet living like he did. But at the same time, he and his family went through some tough financial spots yeah. during that blacklist yeah. time, and he was working ridiculous hours. I mean, a lot of the um, the influence of the movie um, did come from a particular biography by Bruce Cook, but it also came from the screenwriter talking to his Trombo's daughters about what that period was like and I think you could see that personal touch yeah, yeah. coming through like what it was like to live with him he was working ridiculous oh, hours yeah. he was very unpleasant at home it would seem yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, as you can imagine from somebody who's just writing in the bathtub all the time yeah, um, yeah he did famously do that yeah absolutely yeah um, so there... I think Brian Cranston did a fantastic job <laughs> in capturing what who Trumbo kind of was mm. um but yeah, it is it is an interesting film, I think, in the story that it chooses to tell. Uh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I think there is a sense in which Hollywood is still trying to reconcile itself with its own history. I think so. Um, yeah, because as I said, like there's still no real consensus, I think, on why why it happened. Well, and yeah, and I don't think there's ever there ever could be no. because it's definitely a perfect storm, I think. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. see, even understanding the contextual 
um, events going on around in this period. Yeah. And it's like, why go down this path? I mean, it's just... Yeah. It's just a little bit on the edge of insanity. Yeah. And... What, Plus, it does seem so crazy. Like, it's almost like a society tearing itself apart. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, what? Are we talking about America? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a poignant spot to end this episode, to be honest. <laughs> Don't vote for Trump. <laughs> ah. <laughs> On that note. On that note, thank you for staying with us as we near the 60 minute mark. Appropriate. Ooh, ooh. I apologize for the length of this episode, but it's a very complicated <laughs> story. There's um, a lot of details, and I'm glad that I know more about it now, so thank you. Oh, well, thank you. 